first of all, give you an idea of the table of contents. Uh, there are three parts in this book and uh, each part can be defined by a concept, a concept of pickle science. The first one uh, deals with national populism. The second one with ethnic democracy. And the third one with um, electoral authoritarianism. Um, and they follow a kind of chronology because uh, these books deals with Modi's India in, in a rather uh, chronological manner. And uh, uh, the first part on um, national populism uh, deals even with pre-2014 situation because there are a couple of chapters on Modi's Gujarat uh, before turning to uh, Modi's India. Yes, national populism is the main concept for making sense of what was Modi's Gujarat uh, and, and what uh, has become uh, Modi's India in 2014. Th this notion of national populism means that there is a repertoire, a populist repertoire that defines the people as the sons of the soil. You know, populists are supposed to speak in the name of every body, mostly poor people. And the populist claims that he is the people. In the case of the national populist, he doesn't care for minorities so much, uh, but focuses on, on the ethnic majority, religious majority, linguistic majority, uh, or racial majority. So it's a concept, national populism, at the intersection of nationalism and populism. And there is no doubt that Narendra Modi is a Hindu nationalist. He has been trained in RSS since childhood. He has become an RSS of his bearer at a very young age, becoming a Pracharak, a Pran Pracharak, because, before becoming a Sangatan Mantri, an organizing secretary of the BJP. And his commitment to the ideology of Hindu nationalism is uh, a constant uh, that has found expression in uh, many different uh, occasions, uh, including the 2002 uh, pogrom or the uh, inauguration of the Ayodhya temple. You know, if you uh, cover the last 20 years, you will find between these two events, many other episodes, making it very clear that Narendra Modi is a Hindutva person, uh, if not an ideologue, at least a follower of the Hindutva ideology. And in that sense, uh, he's not bringing anything new uh, to BJP, but he's bringing something new to BJP as a populist. And uh, populism is not something the BJP was very good at till he took over. BJP remained for a long time an elite party, a B Brahmin Banya party, um, and uh, that was the main problem. They could not become a mass party because of the lack of popular support uh, among, among plebeians. This is what he has brought. And uh, he has brought this because of his repertoire, because of his discourse, uh, a discourse uh, that first of all crystallized when he was in Gujarat as chief minister criticizing the rulers of New Delhi by saying they were establishment people, elite people, despising, denigrating uh, the periphery, uh, the periphery in geographical terms, Gujarat being at the periphery of India, and the periphery in social terms. And uh, he, he systematically focused and targeted uh, on the uh, Nehru Gandhi dynasty saying that they were born with a silver spoon in their mouth and therefore have had no connection with the plebeians. The, the famous Khan market gang and the uh, English speaking 
intellectuals or journalists or NGO people, liberals. That's typical of the populist. All others have done the same, um, including uh, Trump, Bolsonaro, uh, Netanyahu, Erdogan, Duterte, Orban, the list is very long. But what uh, Narendra Modi has also done, and that the second uh, mainstay of his populism, he has claimed that he was uh, one of them, one of the people, one of the poor, because of his background. And uh, certainly BJP had never had uh, an OBC leader, a low caste leader who was so immersed so familiar with the ideology of Hindutva. So he could combine something unique. He could be a pure product of RSS and at the same time, someone who could claim that he embodied the people, the poor people, at least uh, the plebeians. That the second uh, element uh, of, of his uh, national populism. And, and of course, it's, it's national populism because the elite of Delhi was criticized by him in Gujarat uh, because they were establishment, because um, they were cut off from the roots of the country, but also because they were quote unquote foreigners. And uh, Sonia Gandhi was of course uh, designated as, as a, a Christian uh, in, in the first place. The third element of this national populism uh, has to do with the capacity of Narendra Modi to relate to the people, to speak to the people. Not only is one of them, but he knows how to speak to them. And more importantly, he could saturate the public space uh, with uh, all kinds of uh, techniques of communication, including uh, holograms. And before that, social media. Social media play a very big role in populism uh, across the globe precisely because they allow the leader to relate directly to the people. And uh, that's something incidentally, uh, Indira Gandhi, who was probably the first populist in Indian politics, but a populist of the left, uh, did when she resorted to the radio uh, to relate to the people. Narendra Modi, by the way, also relates to the people by using the radio uh, as evident from the Man Kibat uh, monthly program. So a saturation of the public space is the third mainstay of Modi's uh, national populism. Something that is very costly, holograms are very costly, for instance. And uh, this is why you have the fourth and last pillar of his national populism in crony capitalism. To pay for election campaigns, for saturating the public sphere, the way he has done it as early as 2007 for the uh, state elections in Gujarat, you need a lot of money. And, and, and Modi got this money because of the support he received from um, big businessmen uh, or um, emerging businessmen, uh, including Gautam Adani, of course, who has become uh, the second richest man of India in a record span of time. So this is the first part of the book explaining the crystallization of a new repertoire, at least a new repertoire for BJP uh, that worked. That worked because national populism uh, used polarization as its main technique and the, the polarization was at its best, at its peak in 2014. Um, when you look at the, the um, pattern electorate, election pattern, electoral pattern um, that made possible for the first time for BJP to become uh, the number one party with an absolute majority in the Lok Sabha. Once they were in office, um, they, and he himself, Narendra Modi, uh, initiated a set of policies that I describe as uh, ethnic democracy, uh, another concept coming from uh, political science. The, this idea of ethnic democracy, in fact, comes from Israel. 
because it's a political scientist, a social scientist from Israel, Sami Ismoa, who has introduced this uh, notion. Uh, incidentally, the notion of uh, national populism had been introduced by uh, Gino Germani, who was a Latin American, um, who uh, worked on these issues and these questions in the, in the 1970s. Election, um, elect, sorry, ethnic democracy for SMUA works well in Israel because here is a country where you have elections, where you have a rather independent judiciary, where you have a rather free press, but these democratic, these democratic features are um, countered by inequality of citizens. Israel is, Jewish, is, is a Jewish state. So by definition, Arabs, Palestinians can only be second class citizens, de jure. In India, this status of the minorities is not de jure because the constitution is still the same. India is still a secular country on the paper, but clearly de facto, minorities, Christians, Muslims, have become second class citizens in, in many different ways. And this is something I study in the second part of the book by focusing on the vigilante groups and in particular Bajang Dal that I have studied in detail to show that these groups have introduced a form of parallel state that is implementing cultural policing at the local level. And this is something evident from the campaigns that started immediately after Narendra Modi was elected against law of jihad, against land jihad, something we see also now routinely in Gurgaon, the, the battle for the space. Uh, that is very important for the Hindu nationalist. The idea is uh, Muslims should not be visible in the public sphere and should not be part of mixed neighborhoods. So the fight against land jihad means among, among other things that uh, Muslims should not form minority pockets in Hindu dominated neighborhoods. And uh, the idea is also not to let Hindus sell uh, houses or rent flats um, to Muslims. They, they, the result of this is, of course, ghettoization and the ghettoization of Muslims in, um, in India is now uh, an all pervasive uh, phenomenon uh, affecting most of the cities. So fight against law of jihad, fight against land jihad, fight against conversion and also attempts at reconverting uh, Muslims or Christians like in the Garvapsi uh, movement uh, which took place a few years ago. And last but not least, of course, the cow protection movement uh, with Gorakshak um, patrolling the highways for checking whether trucks uh, were not taking cows to slaughterhouses. Uh, this is the suspicion. And um, as you know, some of these uh, activities have resulted in, in lynchings of uh, Muslim truck drivers. Whatever the campaign, land jihad, love jihad, uh, anti-land jihad and anti-love jihad, uh, Garvapsi or, 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 or Gorakshak, the modus operandi is always the same. Vigilante groups made of somewhat lumpen elements, usually upper caste, but non-educated or hardly educated young men who play the role of a parallel state, a parallel police, uh, with, the, with the police waiting and watching and not intervening uh, when, when any form of intimidation of violence takes place. This is very much in tune with the objective of RSS since its inception 
that is to work at the grassroots level, at the social level, at the societal level, to transform society into a Hindu Rashtra. Right from the beginning, RSS was not interested in uh, state capture, but in social transformation, in the conversion of society into something different. And that's why Edgar Varro, the founder of RSS himself, designated RSS as the Hindu Rashtra in miniature. The RSS had to become co-extensive with society and the shakas, the branches of the RSS were, were the main tools. It was at the grassroots level that things had to happen, that changes had to happen, not in a top-down uh, kind of vertical uh, manoeuvre. And we saw that. We saw that in the uh, post-2014 uh, elections, ethnic democracy and ethnic democracy in the making. Then, and this is the third part uh, of the book, um, we saw forms of authoritarianism bringing the state back in the picture. It had never disappeared, of course, but it became gradually more and more important. Authoritarianism is something that can be implemented by vigilante groups, but more effectively by the state itself to impose his will on the state, Narendra Modi has had to transform the state institutions. And, and we've seen gradually many institutions um, losing out, losing ground. Um, first of all, because most of the time when a populist takes over, he can claim, I am the people, I have the legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis institutions, especially those of checks and balances, which are certainly legal, but not as legitimate as I am. So this argument resulted in many decisions, uh, including the weakening of key institutions, you know, Central Bureau of Investigation, National Investigation Agency, Election Commission, Central Vigilance Commission, Central Information Commission, uh, of course, Parliament. You name one institution and you realize that um, it, has, it has been weakened. And it, it could be weakened in many different ways. One way to do it was to um, change the laws. And here is not a de facto, but a de jure process, the dilution of the uh, RTI Act, for instance, is a case in point. But you can also weaken institutions by uh, changing uh, the leaders, letting their post vacant after retirement. And therefore, um, if there is nobody to do the job, if there is nobody to process the RTI applications, if there is no RTI commissioners, information commissioners, implementation of the RTI Act will be uh, delayed, or you can replace uh, office members uh, by, by friends, by people who will um, obey the orders of the executive. And we saw this in the replacement of uh, um, Ashok Verma, uh, in the replacement of, of uh, uh, um, Ashok Lavasa, Lok Lavasa, uh, and, 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 and CBI and Agent Commission are two of the institutions which have uh, been the most clearly affected. There is one institution that has also suffered, but in a different manner, and that is the judiciary. And the judiciary, especially the Supreme Court, has been affected by usual techniques like post-retirement uh, appointments. If a judge expects uh, a juicy post, a prestigious post, uh, after retirement, it will not be the same way uh, as a judge, inevitably. 
uh, other strategies um, pertain to blackmailing of judges who are no sense and uh, the executive has a file on everybody so it's not too difficult to blackmail uh, some of them and last but not least we saw the judiciary affected by something very new the fact that appointments of judges we are not the monopoly of the collegium anymore. The collegium may make selections, but the appointment of the judges uh, by the executive has not been as systematic as before. And many judges uh, have not been appointed in spite of being selected uh, by the collegium. So this is also an institution that has been affected. The point of no return has certainly not been reached in the case of the judiciary and we have seen the new chief justice um, making some difference refusing for instance to appoint the uh, cbi chief uh, the way the government had anticipated uh, but uh, whether that is only a parenthesis or a, a real transformation uh, remains to be seen so we have many signs of authoritarianism and the weakening of institutions and of checks and balances uh, is clearly uh, one of uh, the clearest signs of this weakening. Now, as I said, it's not a pure form of authoritarianism, it's a form of electoral authoritarianism because at the same time, there are elections. And there are elections because the uh, leader needs to be in a position to claim that he has the legitimacy, that he is the uh, people, the people's choice, that he is the man of the people. So uh, it's very interesting to see that everywhere, everywhere in the world, when populists have taken over, they have continued to organize elections. They need elections for um, claiming that they are the people, that they represent uh, the uh, nation and that they have a mandate. So we've seen elections uh, taking place the way they used to take place in terms of the number of years office bearers um, were uh, elected, but it's not a level playing field anymore. Election campaigns are not level playing fields anymore. And I would mention two uh, changes which matter a lot. One is uh, the amount of money that is spent uh, by uh, the BJP um, during the Lok Sabha elections in 2019, something like uh, $3.6 billion have been spent by the BJP alone. That is as much as all the other parties, all the um, non-BJP parties. That, that makes a big difference. And I, that brings me back to the point I had made on uh, uh, the saturation of the public sphere, uh, the populist way. There is a continuity between the 2007 elections in Gujarat and the 2019 election in, 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 at the Lok Sabha level. Uh, clearly the same amount of money, I mean, the same proportion of uh, money was needed to win elections at the state level and then at the national level. So that makes a big difference. And this is one of the explanations, uh, one of the reasons why crony capitalism has gained momentum uh, in parallel to um, electoral authoritarianism. And the second big difference is, of course, um, the second reason why uh, election campaigns are not level playing fields uh, has to do with the media coverage, uh, the kind of media coverage uh, we've seen in 2014 and 2019, and of course in between, 
show that um, the media, the fifth estate, is not what it used to be anymore. Uh, there is clearly a difference coming from the fear, the loss of independence coming from fear, fears, fear of IT raids, uh, fear of um, ED raids, and uh, and even uh, accusation of sedition uh, against journalists. And in parallel, we've seen um, pro-government media um, being uh, sponsored, supported, something we had, we had seen elsewhere before. Uh, we, we saw Fox TV uh, taking shape in uh, the US. Uh, Republic TV in many ways is the, friend, is, is the Indian equivalent to, to, to Fox TV, Fox News. So that's another development. On the one hand, media outlets are not in a position to oppose. And on the other hand, uh, pro-government uh, outlets are, are, are supported and gain momentum uh, making the um, debates very exceptional. You know, there, there were no debate uh, on TV in any case, uh, and, and there was hardly any press conference given by the prime minister um, during the election campaign and before and after uh, the election campaigns. So this is a case of electoral authoritarianism because there are elections, but the competition is not free and fair. And therefore the risk of losing elections exists but is minimal. And uh, therefore, uh, elections are giving legitimacy to the, to the ruler, um, but not uh, allowing an alternation in power the way uh, it was the case before, the way we were used to. So this is the third part of the book. And um, of course, the book stops with the, um, um, 2020 Delhi riots, um, and 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 I can now update it because many things have happened since then. Um, but but I stop here, and I'm glad I could speak for 20 minutes only, because that leaves us enough time for the discussion. Uh, Dr. Jaslav, there is a, a key explanation which I think you need to bring to the notice of the audience. How the BJP's upper caste dominated uh, architecture consolidated against the what you termed as uh, emerging of plebeians in the political scenario. In fact, we have a dialectic that is at work between the rise of the plebeians, the rise of OBCs in post mandal uh, India and the uh, response um, that is uh, Hindu nationalism and national populism. And never forget that when uh, VP Singh implemented the Mandal Commission report, immediately uh, the organizer, RSS at large, considered that this was, that was as they said, a Shudra revolution. So there was a fear of the rise of the plebeians in the wake of the Mandal moment. One of the objectives was to counter Mandal by resorting to Mandir. And uh, you may remember that um, Advani launched his Ratchatra immediately after uh, in, in September, 1990. But that was not sufficient. BJP could never win an absolute majority. Uh, there were coalitions, but uh, in 2014, it was not very clear whether even the NDA as a coalition could do the job. So even if it, if it, even if it was not the, even, even if Modi was not the cup of tea of RSS, they were very suspicious vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the cult of the personality that he had uh, introduced. Uh, they followed him, they, 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 they sponsored him because they realized that polarization, the way he had already 
implemented in Gujarat could help them win and counter the rise of the plebeians. And that worked. You know, the 2014 government is an amazingly upper caste dominated government. Never, never before since Mandal, you had so few Dalits, OBCs, Adivasis in the government. So the objective had been met. And you know, when you look at the uh, social policies, social programs, which will follow immediately. In fact, as early as August, 2014, Modi introduces Swaj Bharat and Dandan Yojana, and then Ujwal Yojana. So all these programs were programs declared, decided in the name of the poor, but representing hardly any transfer of funds, any effort of redistribution in favor of the poor. They were more symbolic, uh, a sense of what I call a politics of dignity. You recognize the poor as deserving latrines for having an open defecation free India. Uh, the gas cylinder was also given, um, but it was one shot and, and, and not that expensive for the, for the exchequer. Also, uh, Jandan Yojna means that a bank account is open and a plastic card is given, but no money is spent. So this idea that BJP was in 2014 in a position to counter the rise of the plebeians found immediately expression in policies. And the big question is why do the poor vote for Modi? If after five years, we've seen so many policies reconfirming that the BJP is not a pro-poor party, but a pro-rich pro party. And, 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 and you can see this also in the taxation policies. Uh, the taxation policies have systematically spared the, uh, the rich, the wealth tax has been abolished and indirect taxes on petrol, for instance, have increased like anything. So why do the poor vote for Modi? And one of the explanations is in Dudva. Another one is trust, what my colleague Vish, uh, Ilanjan Sirkar calls Vishwas politics. He has not done anything for me yet, but he will. Third, Swaj Bharat, Ujjal Yojana, Jandan Yojana, well, it's not much, but it takes care of us. And Man Ki Baat programs repeat this every month. He speaks to us. But more importantly, and that the fourth explanation, what I call the paradox of reservations. The poor who vote for Modi usually belong to Dalit Jatis, which have not benefited from reservations. In each state, you have Jatis, which have cornered most of the reservations. Jatavs in Uttar Pradesh, Mahars in Maharashtra. Uh, you have the famous Malamadiga divide in, in, in uh, Andhra Pradesh, Tirangana. So what the BJP does, it, they identify the caste groups which have not benefited from reservations. You know, Balmikis in the North, Katiks in the North and they nominate candidates from these caste groups to get their vote because they will not vote for BSP. The same way Mala, the same way Shambars uh, will not vote for our RPI, you know, because RPI is seen as the Maha party, any RPI uh, in Maharashtra. So very interestingly, the poor vote for BJP because they don't want to vote for those who have benefited from reservations and for their party, which should result in some introspection. There is nothing like a Dalit vote. There is nothing like a Dalit block. Now it's so socioeconomically differentiated that reservations itself has generated support for a pro-rich party like, like BJP, paradoxically. That's, that's what I call the paradox of reservations. 
And the percentage of the poor voting for BJP is huge. 30% of the poor voted for BJP if you look at the CSDS results. It's not much less, it's not less, substantially less than the average 37%. That's something that needs to be you know, scrutinized. And, and that's why I, I, I've taken the time to respond to this question in detail. Yeah, yeah that, that's required in fact. Yeah, uh, two more connected questions, and then I will go to one audience who made uh, one question. Uh, do you think by this kind of explanation, do you think the dual hegemony is in the making in India? The one hegemon, uh, hegemony, uh, hegemonic uh, structure operates through the historical cultural systems, and the other hegemonic structure operates through the new kind of emerging globalized elite. Do you think so? Well, there is hegemony when there is a manufactured consent. When uh, the dominated groups cannot think in any alternative manner. They are prisoner of the dominant values, dominant idiom. In, in a way, Sanskritization is the expression of hegemony, you know, because you can't think out of the box, out of the caste system's values. You emulate the Brahmin because the Brahmin is at the top and you want to, to be like him. This is hegemony. To some extent, Indurva works along the same lines. You know? To some extent, we see um, Indurva becoming. Uh, a kind of, uh, if we use Pierre Bourdieu's words, um, the only legitimate repertoire, but to some extent only, because Ambedkarism is still there. Because some um, socialist traditions are still there and they have an alternative uh, repertoire. Because the farmers, the farmers movements, organizations are also articulating a different uh, idiom. No, either because you focus on caste or because you focus on class, you have still repertoires which can contain this um, hegemonic. Uh, traditions uh, or, or attempts, or rather attempts that, 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 that have been made. So that's why I say the, po the, the, the point of no return has not been reached for this very reason. There is a hope for the country in that sense. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and, and also a uh, last question from my end. Uh, do you think uh, by the explanation given in this book, there is no need for the uh, BJP or the RSS to overhaul the constitution to turn India into a Hindu Rashtra. It can do without doing that. That is what you mean to say? Yeah, I think uh, you don't need to, to do things de jure when you can do them de facto. You know, you, you, you spare the pain of uh, convincing opposition parties in the Rajya Sabha to support your own um, your own program. Well, till there is no majority for the BJP in the Rajya Sabha. This is clearly one of the uh, main points that they can explain the limitations of legal transformation and constitutional uh, transformation. But also till the Supreme Court uh, is not validating uh, systematically decisions made by the executive. They, they, they are very complacent uh, in many ways. I mean, they've been very complacent in many ways. Uh, CAA, uh, abolition of Article 370, uh, the Ayodhya Temple uh, verdict. But still, there, there is some uh, resistance and therefore uh, to embark on a major constitutional reform would, would be a distraction and they would create 
intentions, which are not necessary because uh, you can you can make uh, the indurash uh, the indurashtra on, on the ground uh, without changing the law. Uh, waste of time and energy. Okay. So one question from Anand Kumar. I think if you are done with that answer. What are the social social political factors in southern part of India which is not allowing Hindu groups to uh, come to that level which is in the kind of North India? Well, there are many. There are many. First of all, never forget that um, Savarkar's motto was uh, Hindi Hindu Hindu Hindustan or Hindu Dham. Hindi is key for the Hindu nationalist. You know, this is the language. Uh, that needs to be propagated. So inevitably, this is not something very well received among the Dravidian uh, peninsula. And it's not only um, Tamil Nadu, but also um, Kerala, uh, mostly these two parties, these two states, sorry, uh, which are resisting. Secondly, um, especially in these two states, the percentage of upper caste has never been very high in uh, southern India. And uh, as I said, originally the Songpa River has found its roots in the ethos of the upper caste. And thirdly, uh, the Rayotvari system that prevailed in the south, in contrast to the Zamindari system or Jagirdari system which prevailed in the North, made the peasants his own master um, very early. And it's one of the reasons why, in addition to the demographics, you add reservations so early in the South. Reservations in favor of lower caste. Of course, in Travancore, of course, in uh, Madras presidency, you know, by the early years of the 20th century, you have, a reservation system that helps the lower caste to emancipate themselves. For all, for all these reasons, it, it is, it was and it is more difficult for BJP to make inroads electorally. Yeah, this uh, answer raises a connected question. The similar right worry system has been implemented, initiated in the Bengal itself, as Bengal, uh, undivided Bengal otherwise. So then well, how come BJP came to such kind of frontal attacking position in Bengal, though uh, given by this explanation? Well, that's that's a different story. Um, in, in, in Bengal, I'm not at all a specialist of Bengal, but uh, in Bengal, you had a very paradoxical development. In spite of the domination of the left, you did not have any plebeianization of politics. CPIM was a Batralok party a party of the upper caste. And uh, therefore the emancipation of, of, of the um, plebeians uh, did not take place. And paradoxically, BJP was able to make inroads for that reason in, in West Bengal, but to a limited extent only. Um, the other very different, major difference in, in West Bengal is of course the percentage of Muslims. You know, you don't have 30 plus percent of Muslims in many states in India. And uh, that's very good for polarization, especially when you can accuse Bangladeshi migrants to penetrate, infiltrate the state uh, as, as termites, if you remember the words used by uh, Amit, Shah. Uh, Amit Shah himself. So I would not compare the, 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 the reasons why um, BJP has not made so much inroads in the South and why it has not made so much inroads in, the, in, in West Bengal for the same reason, um, because Muslims solidly supported uh, Mamta uh, in the last elections. And that was one of the reasons, one of the major reasons why she won. Um, and, um, and, and, and we'll see. We'll see, but West Bengal yeah. remains one of their key targets. One of their key targets. 
Yeah, Mr. Anand Kumar also asked the same, uh, another question. Uh, is the opposition barking on a wrong tree by attacking Modi personally instead of attacking Modi policy-wise and politics-wise? Well, I think they do both, but uh, media coverage probably focuses more on the personal attacks. You know, when they attack the farmers' laws, they are not attacking Modi as as a persona. Uh, they are attacking a policy. Uh, when they attack crony capitalism and uh, the way privatizations are in fact uh, making the role of crony capitalist even bigger, they're not attacking anybody but 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 a policy. So I think it's more the optics due to the um, media coverage than the reality of these policies which is at stake uh, and, and, and of this politics of the opposition. But the main problem for the opposition is lack of unity. Uh, it, it took 15 years to the opponent of Netanyahu to join hands and dislodge him from power. It took 15 years to the opponent of Erdogan to join hands and to make him lose Istanbul after two elections and he had been the mayor of Istanbul. It may take 15 years for the Indian opposition to join hands, finally realizing that it's a rival, it's a survival uh, yes, question. And they may never join hands because of many reasons that you know as well, as much as I do. So the ball is in their court from that sense in the first place. So, so that means the by these 15 years or 20 years, till the time the opposition comes together uh, on a common platform, uh, by the time is uh, India is facing a danger to transgress ethnic democracy into um, ethnic mobocracy kind? Well, <laughs> mobocracy is still something different. Um, populism is a form of, mobo of mobocracy already. Yeah. Um, vigilant, vigilante groups are somewhat also expressions of a mobocracy because the rule of law takes a back seat always and, and, and mobs uh, take over. Um, but I don't like so much this idea that it's because of mobs. You know, it's like the lynching. I, we, 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 the lynchings, we are called crowd lynchings or mob lynchings. No, behind lynchings, you have always specialists of lynching. You have already organizations, you have groups who have been trained. So it's easy to say, well, it's a spontaneous reaction of the people. The mob is uh, making its traditions uh, prevail, but the mob is led by groups who are, which are trained, very disciplined, and incidentally, we have less lynchings now. Why? Is, is the crowd becoming reasonable or as new orders being given? Yeah, it's interesting. So Professor Inkwant Tirumaligaru uh, suggests there is a Western India also under right worry system where uh, Hindu uh, politics took birth long ago. Yes, but you know, Western India is interesting because uh, it's not at all a stronghold of uh, BJP. In fact, uh, Maharashtra is, uh, is a kind of frontier. They, they, they could prevail with Shidpavan Brahmins, Dishishta Brahmins, the founders of uh, um, RSS and, and Hindu Mahasabha uh, and Der Savarkar. But um, they could never establish a very resilient domination and I'm not saying that it's because of riot worry or not, but uh, clearly it was part of the story. I, I mentioned this factor as one among many others. I'm not at all following a, a materialistic uh, I mean, interpretation of, of politics, uh, but we have to factor in caste equations, um, the uh, settlement that the British had introduced, demography, cultural heterogeneity, linguistic differences, and nothing 
explains politics better than politics itself. So if you want to understand why BGP is so strong in Gujarat, you look at the Congress in Gujarat uh, since Vallabhbhai Patel, and you realize that Congress was the B team of RSS for many years. So the politics of the Congress in Gujarat prepared the ground to some extent for the rise of BJP in, in Gujarat. Politics explain politics better than anything else um, to some extent. So all the factors have to be um, put together and, uh, and, and there is not one, um, one factor that, that prevails. That's why you have to look at things at the state level. Yeah, in your interaction, initial remarks, you mentioned that the Supreme Court officiated the construction of Ram Temple. So in that context, does uh, the slogan of Ram Temple uh, is still a vote catching machine uh, kind of? Uh, well, it's a good question. It's a very good question because, um, you know, this is now a kind of closed chapter after decades after so many decades, they've won. The temple will be built. And the kind of driving force Ram has been for decades against Muslims who were resisting, who were opposing, that's over. So, of course, there'll be a lot of mobilization, emotion, when the temple will be inaugurated, uh, probably around the 2024 20, elections. Uh, but uh, once this is done, you lose a very important driving force. And therefore, you may find another one, Matura, Paranasi, who knows, or realize that another repertoire is needed. And what I found very interesting in the last reshuffles of the Modi government and of the um, Yogi Adityanath uh, government was the kind of caste politics that was played at that time. You know, these reshuffles showed that they were very interested in bringing new caste groups in the uh, executives of the center and of Uttar Pradesh before elections. So it would be, of course, difficult to say now, but caste politics very paradoxically may take over in Dudva politics, at least at the state level in, in the BGP's strategies uh, at the time of election. Uh, at least it has always been there but at least it could prevail a little bit more because Ram is not enough to some extent. And therefore you have to supplement God by caste, another God in a way. 